What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to the Call Game Recap. We are just a few days away from the official Call Game show launching on this channel, so do not be surprised when this channel is rebranded from Kenny For Real to Call Game. It's a project we've been working on for a long time. We'll talk about that later because we had a lot of basketball today. I love these days where the games start off very early. We can just sit down and just watch hoops all day long. And, well, though we didn't have a lot of, like, super incredible, super great games, I do have a lot to talk about. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new. I had a hard time trying to figure out if the top of this show should we should be talking about the trailblazers or should we talk about the washington wizards we will get to both but i think we're gonna start off with the, the portland trailblazers because well they are struggling they lose tonight to the memphis grizzlies who i got to give a lot of love to I've, I've mentioned this plenty of times whether it be on this channel or any of my other channels on my podcast i'm a big fan of what the memphis grizzlies are building over there um and it's good to see jaron jackson back i know he didn't play tonight but good to see him back on the court the other day putting up 20 po points in that one ja morant has been shooting 52 percent from three this month which is insane um if he can somehow obviously he's not gonna shoot <laughs> he's not gonna shoot 52 for an entire season but if if he becomes a, a respectable three-point shooter, oh, the league is in a lot of trouble. Just one of the deepest teams in the league. Jonas Valanciunas, su super crazy, good game for him as well. Um, and, well, let's now transition to the Portland Trailblazers. Good win for the Memphis Grizzlies, a big one for their playoff hopes, their playoff chances. But a bad loss for the Portland Trailblazers, man. They are they are really in a hole right now. As in the last 10 games, they are 2-8 and eight and currently on a five-game losing streak. It's hard to watch this game today and not think about uh, Damian Lillard playing through some injuries. And is at the point now, because um, he's in this slump since he's come back from his injuries, probably better off that he sits the next couple games out to get completely healthy or get closer to completely healthy. Because out there, he's just not the Damian Lillard we know. I did a video on the main channel while I was ranking NBA teams and how fun and how enjoyable they are. Well, the reason why the Portland Trailblazers were relatively high on that list is because of Damian Lillard. Now, if Damian Lillard's not the Damian Lillard from the first half of the season, there's no reason reason to watch this team because they are super underwhelming going into the season I was so high on them because they made the trade for Robert Covington and I'm like man Robert Covington could really help them out Derrick Jones Jr. was a great defensive player for the Miami Heat and the one thing that they really lack was this wing depth this, this wing defense especially since Mo Harkless and Alfred Camino were gone so they added these two players I'm like yes now Dame and CJ can do what they do they have reliable defenders Yusuf Nurkic will be back and hopefully he's healthy for a complete season and they have been extremely underwhelming I understand a part of this is because CJ missed the bulk of the season but even since CJ has been back well, they've been bad. And I guess if you're really paying attention to the advanced analytics and things, you can you could have saw this coming because even when they were 10 games over 500, I remember looking because we were doing this show and they had a negative plus minus or a negative net rating. And the reason they were winning a lot of those games is because Damian Lillard had been so incredible in the crunch time. They were just not losing close games. Well, that has changed, <laughs> and they're starting to lose close games, and now they're back to earth, the team that they were projected to be even when they were really good. Um, and you got to really think about some of the moves this team has made recently. Norman Powell, of course, Norman Powell is a good NBA player. I am not disputing that, but his fit alongside CJ and Damian Lillard is a bit iffy. You're starting three players that are 6'3 and, and smaller, and though Norman Powell is not a terrible defender, he's 6'3 playing a small forward position. This is a team that I thought was going to be better defensively, and they've been one of the worst defensive teams in the entire the entire league. It doesn't help that Carmelo Anthony's coming off the bench, and this is no mellow slander, but we know in his old age he's not a good defender. Um, they brought in Rodney Hollis Jefferson to play a couple minutes because they just need defenders, and he just can't do that. Their backup center has been a, a negative on defense his entire career. They just can't defend anything. Damian Lillard is not the MVP player he had been the entire season because he's coming back from an injury, and those are recipes for disaster. I haven't even got to the coach. Today was so weird, and I know there the bulk of, of Portland Trailblazer fandom is very pro-fire Terry Stotts, and I understand it, but I'm not deep into what the Trailblazers are doing every day. Of course, I watch games, but I'm not analyzing every single game, especially when there's four on at the same time, but I completely understand it. Today, when I was watching this Memphis Grizzly game, there's a situation when they had to inbound the ball. They have two timeouts late in this game, and it is a close game. They had low-key starting to make a little bit of comeback. The Grizzlies were kind of... Um, blowing a lead like they kind of did the last uh, a couple games in the last couple weeks. So they're starting to do this little comeback from the Trailblazers. Norman Powell hits a shot. They get the ball back. They need to get the ball in. And with two timeouts left in a late-game situation, that is close. Terry Stotts allows his player who is inbounding the ball to turn the ball over when he's getting close to the five-second count instead of using a timeout. I honestly couldn't believe it. And I was waiting for the post-game interview for somebody to ask him the question. And, and from what I saw, nobody asked him the question. Why the hell didn't you use a timeout in that situation? I don't know. 
and and, and when I do watch his his post game interviews, it just feels like. This is a, this is a coach whose job has been secure strictly based off his star player loving him. The re- the only reason Terry Stotts has a, a job right now in 2021 is because Damian Lillard a couple years ago was like, no, we riding with Terry. And how are you going to tell your superstar player, your MVP caliber player that we're firing his coach, the coach that he loves so dearly? I think that Damian Lillard needs to come to the realization that, yeah, we've hit a ceiling with the way this team has performed and with this guy as our coach. And, and, and if things continue to go like this, because if we take a look at the standings, well, think they're, they're falling um, dramatically. They were the fourth seed not too long ago. They are down to the seventh seed. They're in the play-in at the moment. And if they go or they don't make the playoffs or they're in the playoffs and they get destroyed by the one seed, yada, 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 they have to come to the realization that Terry Stotts is not the guy. And they may have to come to a deeper realization that maybe the backcourt of CJ and Dame has reached the ceiling. The conference finals run from a few years ago might have been the ceiling of this team because there are things wrong with it. I could see them going into the offseason and be like, hey, we're firing Terry. We're going to run it back with the same roster, and then we'll decide whether we make some roster changes. But the idea of trading CJ for, for a wing just makes the most sense for a lot of teams or for a lot of people, and I'm in that camp too. You know what I'm saying? It is, it is hard to be a successful NBA team when you have a small backcourt. It just is. It just is. So I'm um, super curious about what their future holds. I, I want to take a look at the rest of their schedule because right now, like I mentioned, they're the seventh seed. There are some teams beneath them that's creeping on up. They got the Indiana Pacers, the Memphis Grizzlies again. Oh, my God. How many times are they going to play against the Grizzlies? Um, Brooklyn, Boston, Atlanta, then Cleveland. They have a tr- tough stretch. Now, of course, Damian Lillard can turn it on if he's back healthy and win a bunch of these games. But it feels unlikely because when I watched them, them boys play today, he was really, really out there struggling. Again, shout out to the Memphis Grizzlies. Big time win for them. They're three games over 500, and they are – I'm excited to see how they play in the playoffs, man. As of right now, they are the eight seed. Again, still in the play-in. But these last couple positions for the Western Conference, I'm pretty sure the Western Conference playoffs are set. These are the 10 teams you're going to get. It's just about the seeding right now because the Lakers are just a game and a half over the, the Mavericks, which is crazy. But LeBron will come back eventually. And then the 7 through 10 are all within two games and as I'm recording this video the Warriors just officially won a game so maybe this stands a little bit differently um, but those last couple plays really matter because at the current state of the Trailblazers they only have to win one game to secure their spot in the playoffs but if they drop a little bit more they have to get to two wins and two wins is super hard on the win now a uh, situation so I'm curious to how things work and hopefully by the playoffs David Lewis completely healthy then everything I'm saying in this video don't really matter let's transition to the next game and I know I, I will get to everything I talked about or I watched today but I need to talk about the Washington Wizards because they are the hottest team of basketball right now or one of the hottest teams of basketball because the Knicks are still going they're in the eight game win streak the Knicks are on the nine and they win another game with the Cleveland Cavaliers before I talk about the Wizards let me give my roses to the Cleveland Cavaliers because um, their backcourt has been really good recently. There is no, um, there's no Colin Sexton, so it's a lot of Darius Garland play. And in this month, Darius Garland shooting like 50% from the field, 50% from three, and he's averaging like 24 points per game. It is crazy how much he has improved from year number one to year number two. And somebody on Twitter put this in perspective for me, and this is why I love everybody on Twitter that be replying to my tweets because y'all be having observations that I don't even really think about. The man played just a handful of college basketball games. It was less than five, if I'm not mistaken. There is no summer league play for him. He just get thrown into the NBA and he's bad and and on my podcast we talked about it a bunch last season he was the worst defensive player in the league according to advanced analytics and it doesn't help that he's super small right they had the worst defensive backcourt in the entire NBA this season things have changed dramatically and a lot of that's probably due because of the timetable he's finally healthy for the first time in his career and it's something I didn't really think about when I'm watching this team play he has been amazing and I think it was coach JB Bickerstaff that was like bro you're good at shooting threes Darius Shoot him more. Um, and this year, he's getting to the basket way more than he did last year. He's actually shooting less threes this year than he was last year, even though he's way more efficient this year. I understand what JB is saying. Shoot those threes a little bit more because he had a bunch of big-time shots in this game. Now, he did show his age late into it, and that's probably why they lost. He had a couple crucial turnovers, bad shots here and there. But overall, Darius Garland's game, when it comes to transitioning from year one to year two, he's got to be one of the most improved rookie to sophomore players in this entire draft, for sure. So shout out to them. I'm still... A bit concerned about their size when it comes to three years down the line with Colin Sexton and Darius Garland are both really great. They could be they could be the same thing the Portland Trailblazers are right now. We're like, yes, these two these two guards are amazing and they play well together. But it's probably a ceiling with these guys in your in your backcourt because they are so small. But they are counteracting that with good defensive players outside of that. Um, uh, Jared Allen had an amazing game. Only thing is, he, I, I, he's super young. He's got to get better 
at recognizing things that are around him that's not just going straight up and ducking the ball. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes he gets the ball and he's trying to figure out what to do and he takes so long, it's a turnover, or he telegraphs his pass, it's a turnover, but he's got a lot of time. And, of course, he's a great defensive player, and um, and, and Okoro projects to be very, very good. He's already good now. There's a lot of possessions in this game where he switched on to Russell Westbrook and he prevented Russell Westbrook from getting to the basket. So he's already a good defender, and that's a lot of uh, Cavaliers love. And the other day in the video, I was wearing my Sexland shirt, so y'all know I'm watching these games. But we do have to talk about the Washington Wizards this season now I saw I heard the statistic on on the mismatch with Kevin O'Connor and, and Chris Vernon shout out to the homies do I can I count them as homies I don't know um but they both follow me on Twitter so technically yeah they're homies um they were talking about the Washington Wizards in their up and down season because if you do not remember early in the season they were ass Bradley Beal is on the bench he's showing bad body language he's on the bench he's he couldn't believe that he's on his team and I'm I'm here talking about Bradley Beal free yourself free yourself my guy things have changed dramatically and and right now they're in an eight game win streak and a part of that is because they have the easiest schedule in the league, but you also still have to win those games. It don't matter who you're going against. It's still an NBA roster at the end of the day. We just saw the uh, the Milwaukee Bucks almost pretty much fully healthy lose to a Trey young list Atlanta Hawks. The NBA is still the NBA, and though you have an easy schedule, you still have to put together those wins. So I'm listening to the mismatch. And they talk about how for the first half of the season, before the trade deadline, the Washington Wizards were one of the worst defensive teams in the league. I think they were 26th, 27th. Since the trade deadline, they are second. Do you hear that? They are second in the league defensively. Who would have thought? A team that is playing uh, uh, Davis Bertans heavy minutes is second. They're starting row NATO in the backcourt because they just don't have enough bodies. They are second. What is the determinative factor? It is Daniel Gafford. Now, he doesn't get all the love for this because Russell Westbrook, Bradley Beal had decided to turn it up too. But Daniel Gafford at the center position has been dramatically, like, when they lost Thomas Bryant, a lot of things were lost. You know what I'm saying? Because then you were relying on Robin Lopez. You signed Alex Lynn. You know, like, you're like, you're missing a lot when you lose Thomas Bryant and they make the trade at the trade deadline. Every Bulls fan that watched Daniel Gafford for the first year and a half of his career knew that Daniel Gafford was going to be a good NBA player. The only problem is in Chicago, he was never going to be given the full leash or the he was going to he was on a leash. He was on a very short leash. And the way he plays the game of basketball. He is very dependent on his point guard being able to throw him lobs. He is very dependent on his point guards to find him on the roll. He's playing with Russell Westbrook now. Russell Westbrook got Steven Adams paid. Set a hard screen, play some defense, and you're going to get paid if you're playing with Russell Westbrook. And that's Daniel Gafford. Now, I'm not giving all of Daniel Gafford's success to Russell Westbrook because he does still have to set the hard screens. He does have to give all the energy that he always does. But Russell Westbrook dramatically makes the Daniel Gafford that we saw in spurts in Chicago is being on full display with the Washington Wizards, and they're winning a bunch of games. I've been seeing a lot of people try to think about the long-term future for the Washington Wizards because they can't trade any draft picks. They got Russell Westbrook as contract. They got Bradley Beal here. They, they don't have a ton of young pieces other than Daniel Gafford. Um, and then, of course, Rui Hachibor when he's back from his injury. I don't really want to project about their future. I just think that the fans should be excited about them being a playoff team. They're the 10th seed right now, and honestly, I think the Bulls are out of this race. Um, the Raptors may not be out of it. They're finally starting to get a little bit healthy, but it feels like the Washington Wizards with their strength of schedule going forward will probably be guaranteed the 10th seed. Is the 10th seed enough for them to end up in the actual playoffs? I don't really know, but it'll be hard to bet against Russell Westbrook and, and Bradley Beal in a one-game elimination situation. So we'll see how that goes. So shout out to the, uh, for them. Shout out to them for continuing to go. The Bucs lost a game against the Trey Youngless Atlanta Hawks. I don't know what to make about the Bucs this season. I know this is a back-to-back -back game where they had to fly into Atlanta. I completely understand that sometimes you get those scheduled losses. But even then, losing to the Hawks without Trey Young is not, it's not great. I don't know what to make of them. You know what I'm saying? Because I understand that this team is, is, a, is a contender type team. I don't know if I trust them to be that. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they're in my mind. They might be a pretender. And it's not because of this game. I don't want people taking this out of context. But this entire season, they, they still haven't figured it out. And a lot of that's probably Coach Bud. I don't know how you have as many great defensive players that they have on this team, and they still allow, Bo allow Bogey to just go out there and destroy. Still allow Lou Williams to turn up in the fourth quarter, fourth quarter Lou. They have too many great defenders for things like that to happen as often as it does. Um, so giving love to Atlanta Hawks. I mean, Nate McMillan, when you, when you talk about coaches and their imprint on teams – this is insane. Like, that's one of the biggest questions. How much the coaching really matter? When you look at a team like the Atlanta Hawks, it matters a lot. Because this is not a game that, that Lloyd Pierce wins. It's just not. 
It's not a game Lloyd Pierce wins. Bogey goes insane. Lou Williams didn't score until the fourth quarter where he put up 15, and they win the game. It's just a beautiful thing. I'm looking at the Knicks. I'm looking at the Wizards. <laughs> I'm looking at the Atlanta Hawks. I'm looking at all these teams that are having runs or playing very good right now as a Bulls fan. Everybody else is great, and we're just sitting there like, what's this, the Squidward mean when he's looking out the window? That's how I feel right now. Um, I'm watching the rest of the league. Uh, next, we have the the Charlotte Hornets winning the game against the Celtics. I knew the first two minutes until this game that the Hornets were taking this game. Um, the body language from the, cap, the, the the Celtics were terrible from the very first couple possessions. I think it was Jason Tatum who turned the ball over on like the first minute or so, and it was just like dead in the water from that moment on. But shout out to the Charlotte Hornets for making as many shots as they did. I love to see Miles Bridges mic'd up because he's becoming one of my favorite role players in the entire league. Terry Rozier, I've given him a lot of roses so far this season. The the This team is really good, man. I can't wait till they're completely healthy because I don't think people want to see them in a seven-game series. I wouldn't expect them to get out of the first round, but they're not just going to lose in four like a lower seed typically does in the playoff series. So shout out to them. Um, I don't know what to say about the next versus Suns. I watched this entire game. I don't have a single thing to take away other than Stephen Curry. Oh, no. We talk about Stephen Curry. Other than uh, Kyrie Irving is great. And Kevin Durant is unguardable. What else can I say about that game? Um, and then lastly, we have the Warriors versus the Kings. I waited for the end of this game to record this video. Shout out to my boy Reese for the big time game. Buddy Hill fumbled the bag literally um, when they had a possession where Steph Curry turned the ball over on a double team. They just needed a basket to win the game, and he missed it. Steph Curry missing three free throws in the, while he's shooting 90% for his career is kind of weird, but he did. There's a lot of times I'm watching the Warriors play, and it just feels like Steph Curry and a bunch of like, eh. And I guess that's what this team is. Uh, just a lot of possessions, bro. Shout out to Draymond. I think he had a, like a 19 assist game the other night. He, he backs that up with an 8 point, 13 assist, 14 rebound game. And um, Kelly Oubre's been a lot better recently than compared to the beginning of the season. Still love Juan Toscano Anderson, the energy that he gives. And that is all the games for today. Yeah, it was a great. It was it was good. It was a good slate of games. Have we been talking for 17 minutes? <laughs> I don't even know how this possible. It's the longest recap video ever. But I guess I had a lot to talk about. Um, Called game Wednesday. I don't know exactly what time. I have a meeting in the morning to determine the time. But I'm super excited for y'all to see this. I just hope that y'all enjoy it. Um, I, I think I'm going to do a QA and a on like Twitch on Twitter. Answering a bunch of questions. I know I've been very vague about what this project is. And to answer this simple question. It is an interview based show. Where I'm having NBA players and people in the media. And yada yada on the show. To just talk about hoops. Talk about players careers. But even deeper than that. I don't know what this show looks like in a month. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I want to continue to evolve the show. As I learn how to interview. And how I learn how to talk to new people. If that makes sense. So episode one is a banger. I tell you that much. Episode one was a banger, and I'm excited for y'all to see that. We actually dropping a teaser tomorrow, so follow the call game on Twitter. And that's pretty much it. I'll see y'all soon. Call game. I can't believe this went 18 minutes.